This is a session where I introduce basic electricity, uh, which means really current and voltage and simple circuits. I then have a later lecture where we do some more complex circuits. The vocabulary we end up introducing, uh, which I do throughout, is a circuit. What is a circuit? I introduce the idea of circled current and voltage, electrical components, and then what are conductors and insulators. So I first talk about how electrical energy flows through wires and make the analogy of water flowing through pipes. And I point out that this flow is called electrical current. And then a circuit is a collection of wires and electrical items joined together with no breaks. So I introduce the idea this is like a circle. If you put your pencil down on one point on the circuit, you can follow it around and get back to where you started. And what's important is as this electrical current flows through the components, it makes them work. Now light bulbs, what I want to do is make sure they understand that this isn't magic. Uh, rather than holding up a fluorescent, an incandescent bulb, which has been around for 100 years, we want to make them a little more energy conscious. So I use a compact fluorescent, uh, which are becoming, of course, more common. And I ask the students, where do you think you connect wires? Uh, most of them understand that the bottom of the bulb is one of those places, but <clears throat> most of them miss the fact that the side here is going to be the other place. A lot of them feel it, look at it here, some even point to the glass. I then show them some basic symbols for how we draw circuits. So they will recognize what a battery is, a switch is, and of course the lines being, being just wires. So I then introduce the concept of a switch and how it will make or break a circuit. And the big point that if you open the switch and break the circuit where you no longer have this loop, that you no longer can have electricity flow. Then I hand them some electrical components. I send them a give them a battery. I find using a holder makes it easier for them to make connections. A switch and a light bulb holder along with some wires. I then ask them to connect them in different ways to let them kind of play around and see what will light the light bulb and what doesn't. Then I ask them did they make the following connection which I'm showing here. And I show them that as that switch closes it will light the light bulb. So I asked them, did it, or if they, if they did it, did it work? Otherwise, you know, would it work if they had done it that way? And I asked what things are required to make the circuit work. I want to make sure they understand it's got to be a circuit, as well as it needs a working light bulb and a working battery and a closed switch. Um, then I bring up some examples and ask them what will work. I have something without a battery, something that does work, a broken, a broken circuit, a non-circuit, and then I tell them now we're going to get you some harder ones. And then this one they really can't answer yet because they don't really know what happens when you hook two batteries together. So I ask them, what's the resulting voltage? And we talk about pluses and minuses and how these add together so that in this case, you get twice as much voltage, but in this case, you get zero voltage. Then I give them this, where everybody focuses on all the funny wires going all over the place, and many of them don't notice that one end connects to the glass. Again, it makes them slow down and think, is everything in place the way it needs to be? Then I want to make sure they understand about conductors and insulators. And I define a conductor that anything is anything that electricity will flow through. And I do say easily. I point out that electricity can go through air if there's enough, but that's not really enough to count as a conductor. We, we would consider that an insulator, which is any material that the electricity cannot go through easily. Then we get down to asking which of the following conductors. The trick in here is I bring in two mechanical pencils, a plastic one and a metal one, and show them it depends on the material. 
The real question I want them to think about, though, is how would you test them? Most of them focus on, well, let me try to figure out what material it is, but what I want them to do is get more into electrical testing, which is where I get into putting, actually putting the test object into an electric circuit. If it's a conductor, the bulb is going to light. If it's an insulator, it's not going to light. Then I ask about the effect of more bulbs, and I ask them, what do you think would happen if we put another bulb in the circuit? And then I ask them, before they try to jump to an answer, to think about some facts. How much energy is, is flowing in the circuit? <clears throat> How many components are in the circuit? How bright do we expect the bulbs to be? And I give them this challenge. I let them now connect another bulb in the circuit. And I ask them, did it do what they expected it to do? And they had a lot of different expectations. Unfortunately, this is sensitive enough that generally we get two dimly lit bulbs, but sometimes one of them doesn't light. But they, they're still able to get the idea that we, do, we have divided up the circuit. Many of them already figure out what they need to do at this point is add another battery to make the bulbs get brighter. And generally, I don't spend the time having them actually draw a picture. And what I'll do instead is simply show them this is the picture of what they have configured themselves. Now, some of them in trying to configure this, rather than a series circuit, end up with a parallel circuit, which I don't discuss in this lecture. So that's something I just kind of straighten them out on how to connect it. Then we get to, if we added bulbs now, then we get back to the question of what happens if you add more power. And I point out these batteries are one and a half volts. So that's how much, that's how much energy we have uh, to generate power. So we ask what happens if we're able to increase the energy by increasing the number of batteries. Most of them get the idea, since they're thinking about two bulbs, that it'll now light them as bright as the one bulb and one battery were. Then they all actually will start asking questions about what if I put three batteries in, what if I have three bulbs, what if I have three batteries and one bulb. They, they go through some of these iterations to try to get that, so we try to get them the understanding of the relationships. So I said, say to them, think about <clears throat> what are we stuck? And now I ask them, them to actually go ahead and do it and what happened wasn't really what they expected. Then, kind of for fun, I want to show them that not all batteries look like D-cells. So instead, what I have is a lemon, and they all think that's fun. And what I tell them I'm going to do is I put a zinc screw into the lemon, and since I don't have, I don't know where to find a copper screw, I put, I just take a piece of copper, heavy gauge copper wire, and I put it in. Then I end up taking my, my light bulb again and connecting it to both sides. Typically, this is not going to generate enough power to light the bulb. Oops. That doesn't light the bulb. So the question comes up, here's, here's the piece of zinc, here's the copper, here's the bulb, and the question was, will the bulb light? And then, when the answer was no, we said, is the lemon generating any electricity? And how might we test it? And that's when I pull out my meter, and instead of the light bulb, I connect my, I connect my voltmeter to the lemon battery. It typically shows right around one volt or nine-tenths of a volt. And then we explain why that's just not quite enough to light. That's why we have one and a half volt batteries, is these bulbs won't light 
with, with one bolt. So they all want to see, can you, they still don't quite believe it can light light bulbs. So the next thing I do is pull out a second lemon, connect the two together and show that this now generates enough voltage to light the bulb. After I've been talking about these different kinds of batteries and the energy needed to do things, I think it's important to include a little bit about safety and get them to feel for different kinds of voltages. So I kind of remind them that these little batteries they're used to are one and a half volts. And I asked them about the lemon battery, which as they just saw, was a little less than a volt. But then I asked them about the wall socket. Most of them don't seem to have been aware that there's 110 volts as the household voltage. And I point out right away that this is not something you want to touch, that this is a this, this is dangerous amount of voltage. Then I asked them about a home air conditioner uh, running on 220 volts, just to introduce the fact that there actually is 220 in their house as well as 110, and it's used for high, high energy appliances. Then, just to give them some perspective, I point out the window to the, the lines that are running up and down. And, we, and while there's some are, are telephone and some are electric, I point out these are a lot of voltage. If there's a storm and one of these come down, they never want to get anywhere near it. This is quite dangerous. And then the final question, of course, is, so what voltage is safe to touch? And we have a little discussion about how much voltage you get from different places. I've been asked before what voltage is on a telephone line. I think that's 48 volts, which you probably ought to stay away from. It's a little higher than you want to touch, but not critical. 